Labor Hulies by Agatha Christie Audiobook 8x16 Both for her sake and his own there must be no scandal. As noiselessly as possible, Sybil, he sprinted down the passage and back into his room. Just as he reached it, he heard the sound of an opening door. 221 He sat in his room for nearly half an hour, waiting. He dared not go out. Sooner or later, he felt sure, Elsie would come. There was a light tap on his door. Harold jumped up to open it. It was not Elsie who came in but her mother and Harold was aghast at her appearance. She looked suddenly years older. Mother and Harold was aghast at her appearance. She looked suddenly years older. Were deep black circles under her eyes. He sprang up and helped her to a chair. She sat down, her breath coming painfully. Harold said quickly. You look all in, MRS. Rice. Can I get you something? She shook her head. N0. Never mind me. I'm all right, really. It's only the shock. MR. Waring, a terrible thing has happened. Harold asked. Is Clayton seriously injured? She caught her breath. Worse than that. He's dead. V. The room spun round. A feeling as of icy water trickling down 222 his spine rendered Harold incapable of speech for a moment or two. He repeated dully. Z.W. M.R.S. Rice nodded. She said, and her voice had the flat level tones of complete exhaustion. The corner of that marble paperweight the corner of that marble paperweight and he fell back with his head on the iron fender. I don't know which it was that killed him but he is certainly dead. I have seen death often enough to know point 53 disaster. That was the word that rang insistently in Harold's brain. Disaster, disaster, disaster. He said vehemently. It was an accident. I saw it happen. MRS. Rice said sharply. Of course it was an accident. Slash know that. But but is anyone else going to think so? I'm. Frankly, I'm frightened. Harold. This isn't England.35 Harold said slowly. CC. Can confirm Elsie's story. MRS. Rice said. Yes, and she can confirm yours. That. That is just it. 223 Harold, T.S. Brain, naturally a keen and cautious one, saw her point. He reviewed the whole thing and appreciated the weakness of their position. He and Elsie had spent a good deal of their time together. Then there was the fact that they had been seen together in the pine woods by one of the Polish women under rather compromising circumstances. The Polish ladies apparently spoke no English, but they might nevertheless understand it a little. The woman might have known the meaning of words like jealously and husband if she had chanced to overhear their conversation. Anyway it was clear that it was something she had said to Clayton that had aroused his jealousy. And now. His death. When Clayton had died, he, Harold, had been in Elsie Clayton's room. There was nothing to show that he had not deliberately assaulted Philip Clayton with the paperweight. Nothing to show that the jealous husband had not actually found them together. There was only his word and Elsie's. Would they be believed? A cold fear gripped him. He did not imagine. No, he really did their time together. Then there was the fact that they had been seen together in the pine woods by one of the Polish women under rather compromising circumstances. The Polish ladies apparently spoke no English but they might nevertheless understand it a little. The woman might have known the meaning of words like jealously and husband if she had chanced to overhear their conversation. Anyway it was clear that it was something she had said to Clayton that had aroused his jealousy. And now. His death. When Clayton had died, he, 
Harold, had been in Elsie Clayton's room. There was nothing to show that he had not deliberately assaulted Philip Clayton with the paperweight. Nothing to show that the jealous husband had not actually found them together. There was only his word and Elsie's. Would they be believed? A cold fear gripped him. He did not imagine. No, he really did surely, in any case, it could only be a surely, in any case, it could only be a them. Did they have manslaughter in these foreign countries? But even if they were acquitted of blame there would have to be an inquiry. It would be reported in all the papers. An English man and woman accused jealous husband rising politician. Yes, it would mean the end of his political career. It would never survive a scandal like that. He said on an impulse. Can't we get rid of the body somehow? Plant it somewhere. MRS. Rice's astonished and scornful look made him blush. She said incisively. My dear Harold, this isn't a detective story. To attempt a thing like that would be quite crazy. I suppose it would. 35 he groaned. What can we do? My God, what can we do? MRS. Rice shook her head despairingly. She was frowning, her mind working painfully. Harold demanded. Isn't there anything we can do? Anything to avoid this frightful disaster? There, it was out disaster. Terrible. Unforeseen. Utterly damning. They stared at each other. MRS. Rice said hoarsely. Elsie. My little girl. I'd do anything. It will kill her if she has to go through a thing like this. And she added. You too, your career. Everything. Harold managed to say. Never mind me. But he did not really mean it. MRS. Rice went on bitterly. And all so unfair. So utterly untrue. It's not as though there had ever been anything between you. I know that well enough. Harold suggested, catching at a straw. You'll be able to say that at least that it was all perfectly all right. MRS. Rice said bitterly. Yes, if they believe me. But you know what these people out here are like. Harold agreed gloomily. To the continental mind, there would undoubtedly be a guilty connection between himself 226 and Elsie, and all MRS. Rice's denials would be taken as a mother lying herself black in the face for her daughter. Harold said gloomily. Yes, we're not in England, worse luck. Ah. Uh, MRS. Rice lifted her head. That's true. It's not England. I wonder now if something could be done. Yes. Harold looked at her eagerly. MRS. Rice said abruptly. How much money have you got? Not much with me. He added. I could wire for money, of course. MRS. Rice said grimly. We may need a good deal. But I think it's worth trying. Harold felt a faint lifting of despair. He said. What is your idea? MRS. Rice spoke decisively. We haven't a chance of concealing the death ourselves, but I do think there's just a chance of hushing it up officially. You really think so? Harold was hopeful but slightly incredulous. Yes. For one thing the manager of the hotel will be on our side. He'd much rather have the thing hushed up. It's my opinion 227 that in these out-of-the-way curious little Balkan countries you can bribe anyone and everyone and the police are probably more corrupt than anyone else, 33 Harold said slowly. Do you know, I believe you're right. 33 MRS. Rice went on. Fortunately, I don't think anyone in the hotel heard anything. 33 Who has the room next to Elsie's on the other side from yours? 33 The two Polish ladies. They didn't hear anything.
they'd have come out into the passage if they had. Philip arrived late, nobody saw him but the night porter. Do you know, Harold, I believe it will be possible to hush the whole thing up. And get Philip's death certified as due to natural causes. It's just a question of bribing high enough. And finding the right man. Probably the chief of police, 33 Harold smiled faintly. He said. It's rather comic opera, isn't it? Well, after all, we can but try.33 MRS. Rice was energy personified. First the manager was summoned. Harold RE228 mained in his room, keeping out of it. He and MRS. Rice had agreed that the story told had better be that of a quarrel between husband and wife. Elsie's youth and prettiness would command more sympathy. On the following morning various police officials arrived and were shown up to MRS. Rice's bedroom. They left at midday. Harold had wired for money but otherwise had taken no part in the proceedings. Indeed he would have been unable to do so since none of these official personages spoke English. At 12 o'clock MRS. Rice came to his room. She looked white and tired, but the relief on her face told its own story. She said simply. See it's work slash marvelous. It seems incredible. MRS. Rice said thoughtfully. By the ease with which it went, you might almost think it was quite normal. They practically held out their hands right away. It's... It's rather disgusting, really. Harold said dryly. This isn't the moment to quarrel with 229 the corruption of the public services. How much? The tariff's rather high point 55 she read out a list of figures. The chief of police. The commissaire. The agent. The doctor. The hotel manager. The night porter. Harold's comment was merely. The night porter doesn't get much, does he? I suppose it's mostly a question of gold lace. MRS. Rice explained. The manager stipulated that the death should not have taken place in his hotel at all. The official story will be that Philip had a heart attack in the train. He went along the corridor for air. You know how they always leave those doors open. And he fell out on the line. It's wonderful what the police can do when they try, five well, said Harold. Thank God our police force isn't like that and in a British and superior mood he went down to lunch. The manager stipulated that the death should not have taken place in his hotel at all. The official story will be that Philip had a heart attack in the train. He went along the corridor for air. You know how they always leave those doors open. And he fell out on the line. It's wonderful what the police can do when they try, five well, said Harold. Thank God our police force isn't like that. And in a British and superior mood he went down to lunch. Nationality. Harold thought a mustache like that must be French Elsie said German and MRS. Rice thought he might be Spanish. There was no one else but themselves on the terrace with the exception of the two Polish ladies who were sitting at the extreme end, both doing fancy work. As always when he saw them. Harold felt a queer shiver of apprehension pass over him. Those still faces, those curved beaks of noses, those long claw-like hands. A page boy approached and told MRS. LOH 16231 Rice she was wanted. She rose and followed him. At the entrance to the hotel they saw her encounter a police official in full uniform. Elsie caught her breath. You don't think anything's gone wrong. Harold reassured her quickly. Oh no, no, nothing of that kind. But he himself knew a sudden pang of fear. He said. Your mother's been wonderful. I know. Mother is a great fighter. She'll never sit down under defeat. Elsie shivered. 
but it is all horrible, isn't it? Now, don't dwell on it. It's all over and done with. Elsie said in a low voice. I can't forget that. That it was I who killed him. Harold said urgently. Don't think of it that way. It was an accident. You know that really. Her face grew a little happier. Harold added. And anyway it's past. The past is 232 are the past. Try never to think of it again.55 MRS. Rice came back. By the expression on her face they saw that all was well. It gave me quite a fright slash five she said almost gaily. But it was only a formality about some papers. Everything's all right, my children. We're out of the shadow. I think we might order ourselves a liqueur on the strength of it. The liqueur was ordered and came. They raised their glasses. MRS. Rice said. To the future. Harold smiled at Elsie and said. To your happiness. She smiled back at him and said as she lifted her glass. And to you. To your success. I'm sure you're going to be a very great man. With the reaction from fear they felt gay, almost lightheaded. The shadow had lifted. All was well. From the far end of the terrace the two bird-like women rose. They rolled up their work carefully. They came across the stone flags. With little bows they sat down by MRS. Rice. One of them began to speak. The 233 other one let her eyes rest on Elsie and Harold. There was a little smile on her lips. It was not, Harold thought, a nice smile. Smile. Listening to the Polish woman and though he couldn't understand a word, the expression on MRS. Rice's face was clear enough. All the old anguish and despair came back. She listened and occasionally spoke a brief word. Presently the two sisters rose, and with stiff little bows went into the hotel. Harold leaned forward. He said hoarsely. What is it, 39 MRS? Rice answered him in the quiet hopeless tones of despair. Those women are going to blackmail us. They heard everything last night. And now we ve tried to hush it up it makes the whole thing a thousand times worse. 8 Harold Waring was down by the lake. He had been walking feverishly for over an hour, trying by sheer physical energy to still the clamor of despair that had attacked him. 234 He came at last to the spot where he had first noticed the two grim women who held his life and Elsie's in their evil talons. He said aloud. Curse them. Damn them for a pair of devilish blood-sucking harpies. A slight cough made him spin round. He found himself facing the luxuriantly moustached stranger who had just come out from the shade of the trees. Harold found it difficult to know what to say. This little man must have almost certainly overheard what he had just said. Harold, at a loss, said somewhat ridiculously. Oh. E.R. Good afternoon. In perfect English the other replied. But for you, I fear, it is not a good afternoon. Well. E.R. I. Harold was in difficulties again. The little man said. You are, I think, in trouble. Monsieur? Can I be of any assistance to you? Oh no thanks, no thanks. Just blowing off steam, you know. The other said gently. But I think, you know, that I could help 235 you. I am correct, am I not? in connecting your troubles with two ladies who were sitting on the terrace just now. Harold stared at him. Do you know anything about them? He added. Who are you, anyway? Three as though confessing to royal birth the little man said modestly. Slash M. Hercule Poirot. Shall we walk a little way into the wood and you shall tell me your story? As I say, 
I think I can aid you. To this day, Harold is not quite certain what made him suddenly pour out the whole story to a man to whom he had only spoken a few minutes before. Perhaps it was overstrain. Anyway, it happened. He told Hercule Poirot the whole story. The latter listened in silence. Once or twice he nodded his head gravely. When Harold came to a stop the other spoke dreamily. The Stymphalian birds, with iron beaks, who feed on human flesh and who dwell by the Stymphalian lake. Yes, it accords very well. 35 I beg your pardon, said Harold staring. 236 perhaps, he thought, this curious looking little man was mad. Hercule Poirot smiled. I reflect, that is all. I have my own way of looking at things, you understand. Now as to this business of yours. You are very unpleasantly placed. Point three. Harold said impatiently. I don't need you to tell me that. Hercule Poirot went on. It is a serious business, blackmail. These harpies will force you to pay. And pay and pay again. And if you defy them, well, what happens? Harold said bitterly. The whole thing comes out. My career's ruined, and a wretched girl who's never done anyone any harm will be put through hell, and God knows what the end of it all will be. Therefore, said Hercule Poirot, something must be done. Harold said baldly. What? Hercule Poirot leaned back, half closing his eyes. He said, and again a doubt of his sanity crossed Harold's mind. It is the moment for the castanets of bronze. 237 Harold said. Are you quite mad? 55 The other shook his head. He said. Mats non. I strive only to follow the example of my great predecessor, Hercules. Have a few hours patience, my friend. By tomorrow I may be able to deliver you from your persecutors. Point 55 Therefore, said Hercule Poirot, something must be done. Harold said baldly. What? Hercule Poirot leaned back, half closing his eyes. He said, and again a doubt of his sanity crossed Harold's mind. It is the moment for the castanets of bronze. 237 Harold said. Are you quite mad? 55 The other shook his head. He said. Mets non. I strive only to follow the example of my great predecessor, Hercules. Have a few hours patience, my friend. By tomorrow I may be able to deliver you from your persecutors. Point 55 Well, 55 Hercule Poirot beamed upon him. It is well. Point 55 What do you mean? 55 Everything has settled itself satisfactorily. Point 55 Well, 55 Hercule Poirot beamed upon him. It is well. Point 55 What do you mean? 55 Everything has settled itself satisfactorily. Point 55 Tell me just what? 55 Tell me just what? 55 Coming up the path from the lake were two figures with flapping cloaks and profiles like birds. He exclaimed. I thought you said they had been taken away. 55 Hercule Poirot followed his glance. Oh, those ladies? They are very harmless, Polish ladies of good family, as the porter told you. Their appearance is, perhaps, not very pleasing but that is all.55 But I don't understand I 239 No, you do not understand. It is the other ladies who were wanted by the police. The resourceful MRS. Rice and the lacrimose MRS. Clayton. It is they who are well-known birds of prey. Those two, they make their living by blackmail. Monday Cher Harold had a sensation of the world spinning round him. He said faintly. But the man the man who was killed. No one was killed. There was no man, three but I saw him, fifty-three oh no. The tall deep-voiced MRS. Rice is a very successful male impersonator. 
it was she who played the part of the husband. Without her grey wig and suitably made up for the part. He leaned forward and tapped the other on the knee. You must not go through life being too credulous, my friend. The police of a country are not so easily bribed they are probably not to be bribed at all certainly not when it is a question of murder. These women trade on the average Englishman's ignorance of foreign 240 languages. Because she speaks French or German, it is always this MRS. Rice who interviews the manager and takes charge of the affair. The police arrive and go to her room, yes. But what actually passes? You do not know. Perhaps she says she has lost a brooch something of that kind. Any excuse to arrange for the police to come so that you shall see them. For the rest, what actually happens? You wire for money, a lot of money, and you hand it over to MRS. Rice who is in charge of all the negotiations. And that is that. But they are greedy, these birds of prey. They have seen that you have taken an unreasonable aversion to these two unfortunate Polish ladies. The ladies in question come and hold a perfectly innocent conversation with MRS. Rice and she cannot resist repeating the game. She knows you cannot understand what is being said. So you will have to send for more money which MRS. Rice will pretend to distribute to a fresh set of people. M. Harold drew a deep breath. He said. And Elsie. Elsie. Hercule Poirot averted his eyes. She played her part very well. She 241 always does. A most accomplished little actress. Everything is very pure very innocent. She appeals, not to sex, but to chivalry. M. Hercule Poirot added dreamily. That is always successful with Englishman. W. Harold Waring drew a deep breath. He said crisply. I'm going to set to work and learn. I'm going to set to work and learn. Going to make a fool of me a second time. 242 7 The Cretan bull Hercule Poirot looked thoughtfully at his visitor. He saw a pale face with a determined looking chin, eyes that were more grey than blue and hair that was of that real blue-black shade so seldom seen the hyacinthine locks of ancient Greece. He noted the well-cut, but also well-worn, country tweeds, the shabby handbag, and the unconscious arrogance of manner that lay behind the girl's obvious nervousness. He thought to himself. Ah yes, she is the county. But no money. And it must be something quite out of the way that would bring her to me. Diana Maberly said, and her voice shook a little. C.C. I don't know whether you can help 243 me or not, M. Poirot. It's... It's a very extraordinary position. 33 Poirot said. But yes? Tell me. Diana Maberly said. I've come to you because I don't know what to do. I don't even know if there is anything to do. Will you let me be the judge of that? The color surged suddenly into the girl's face. She said rapidly and breathlessly. 243 me or not, M. Poirot. It's... It's a very extraordinary position. 33 Poirot said. But yes? Tell me. Diana Maberly said. I've come to you because I don't know what to do. I don't even know if there is anything to do. Will you let me be the judge of that? The color surged suddenly into the girl's face. She said rapidly and breathlessly. I've been engaged to for over a year has broken off our engagement. She stopped and eyed him defiantly. You must think, she said, that I'm completely mental. Slowly. Hercule Poirot shook his head. On the contrary. Mademoiselle, I have no doubt whatever but that you are extremely intelligent. It is certainly not my métier in life to patch up the lovers' quarrels, and I know very well that you are quite aware of that. It is, therefore, that there is something unusual about the breaking of this engagement. That is so, 
is it not? 244 The girl nodded. She said in a clear, precise voice. Hugh broke off our engagement because he thinks he is going mad. He thinks people who are mad should not marry. Hercule Poirot's eyebrows rose a little. And do you not agree? I don't know. What is being mad, after all? Everyone is a little mad. It has been said so, Poirot agreed cautiously. It's only when you begin thinking you're a poached egg or something that they have to shut you up. And your fiancé has not reached that stage. Diana Maberly said. I can't see that there's anything wrong with Hugh at all. He's, oh, he's the sanest person I know. Sound. Dependable. Then why does he think he is going mad? Poirot paused a moment before going on. Is there, perhaps, madness in his family? Reluctantly Diana jerked her head in assent. She said. His grandfather was mental, I believe 245 assent. She said. His grandfather was mental, I believe 245 and some great aunt or other. But what I say is, that every family has got someone queer in it. You know, a bit half-witted or extra clever or something her eyes were appealing. Hercule Poirot shook his head sadly. He said. I am very sorry for you. Mademoiselle. Her chin shot out. She cried. See. Don't want you to be sorry for me. I want you to do something. What do you want me to do? C.C. Don't know but there's something wrong and will you tell me mademoiselle, all about your fiancé? Diana spoke rapidly. His name's Hugh Chandler. He's 24. His father is Admiral Chandler. They live at Lyde Manor. It's been in the Chandler family since the time of Elizabeth. Hugh's the only son. He went into the Navy all the Chandlers are into the Navy all the Chandlers are since Sir Gilbert Chandler sailed with Sir Walter Raleigh in 15-something or other. Hugh went into the Navy as a matter of course. His father wouldn't have heard of anything else. And yet. And yet, it was his father who insisted on getting him out of it, 33 when was that? Nearly a year ago. Quite suddenly. Was Hugh Chandler happy in his profession? Absolutely. There was no scandal of any land. About Hugh? Absolutely nothing. He was getting on splendidly. He he couldn't understand his father. What reason did Admiral Chandler himself give? Diana said slowly. He never really gave a reason. Oh. He said it was necessary Hugh should learn to manage the estate. But. But that was only a pretext. Even George Frobisher realized that. Who is George Frobisher? Colonel Frobisher. He's Admiral Chandler's oldest friend and Hugh's godfather. He spends most of his time down at the manor. And what did Colonel Frobisher think of Admiral Chandler's determination that his son should leave the Navy? Who is George Frobisher? Colonel Frobisher. He's Admiral Chandler's oldest friend and Hugh's godfather. He spends most of his time down at the manor. And what did Colonel Frobisher think of Admiral Chandler's determination that his son should leave the Navy? He was dumbfounded. He couldn't understand it at all. Nobody could point 59 not even Hugh Chandler himself. Diana did not answer at once. Poirot waited a minute, then he went on. At the time, perhaps, he, too, was astonished. But now? Has he said nothing? Nothing at all. Diana murmured reluctantly. He said. About a week ago. That. That his father was right. That it was the only thing to be done. Did you ask him why? Of course. But he wouldn't tell me. Hercule Poirot reflected for a minute or two. 
Then he said. Have there been any unusual occurrences in your part of the world? Starting, perhaps, about a year ago? Something that has given rise to a lot of local talk and surmise. She flashed out. I don't know what you mean. Poirot said quietly, but with authority in his voice. You had better tell me. There wasn't anything nothing of the kind you mean. Of course. But he wouldn't tell me. Hercule Poirot reflected for a minute or two. Then he said. Have there been any unusual occurrences in your part of the world? Starting, perhaps, about a year ago? Something that has given rise to a lot of local talk and surmise. She flashed out. I don't know what you mean. Poirot said quietly, but with authority in his voice. You had better tell me. There wasn't anything nothing of the kind you mean. But they didn't catch the person who had done it. No. She added fiercely. But if you think. Poirot held up his hand. He said. You do not know in the least what I think. Tell me this, has your fiancé consulted a doctor? No, I'm sure he hasn't. Wouldn't that be the simplest thing for him to do? Diana said slowly. He won't. He. He hates doctors. And his father. I don't think the Admiral believes much in doctors either. Says there are a lot of humbug merchants. 249 How does the Admiral seem himself? Is he well? Happy. Diana said in a low voice. He's aged terribly in. In. In the last year. Yes. He's a wreck. A sort of shadow of what he used to be. Point fifty five. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. Then he said. Did he approve of his son's engagement? Oh yes. You see, my people's land adjoins his. We've been there for generations. He was frightfully pleased when Hugh and I fixed it up. And now? What does he say to your engagement being broken off? The girl's voice shook a little. She said. I met him yesterday morning. He was looking ghastly. He took my hand in both of his. He said. If's hard on you, my girl. But the boy's doing the right thing. The only thing he can do point nine and so, said Hercule Poirot, you came to me. She nodded. She asked. Can you do anything? 250 Hercule Poirot replied. I do not know. But I can at least come down and see for myself. Point 53 2 It was Hugh Chandler's magnificent physique that impressed Hercule Poirot more than anything else. Tall, magnificently proportioned, with a terrific chest and shoulders, and a tawny head of hair. There was a tremendous air of strength and virility about him. On their arrival at Diana's house, she had at once rung up Admiral Chandler, and they had forthwith gone over to Lyde Manor where they had found tea waiting on the long terrace. And with the tea, three men. There was Admiral Chandler, white-haired, looking older than his years, his shoulders bowed as though by an over-heavy burden, and his eyes dark and brooding. A contrast to him was his friend Colonel Frobisher, a dried-up, tough, little man with reddish hair turning grey at the temples. A restless, irascible, snappy, little man, rather like a terrier. But the possessor of a pair of extremely shrewd eyes. He had a habit of drawing down his it was Hugh Chandler's magnificent physique that impressed Hercule Poirot more than anything else. Tall, magnificently proportioned, with a terrific chest and shoulders, and a tawny head of hair. There was a tremendous air of strength and virility about him. On their arrival at Diana's house, she had at once rung up Admiral Chandler, and they had forthwith gone over to Lyde Manor where they had found tea waiting on the long terrace. And with the tea, three men. There was Admiral Chandler, white-haired, looking older than his years, 
his shoulders bowed as though by an overheavy burden, and his eyes dark and brooding. A contrast to him was his friend Colonel Frobisher, a dried-up, tough, little man with reddish hair turning grey at the temples. A restless, irascible, snappy, little man, rather like a terrier but the possessor of a pair of extremely shrewd eyes. He had a habit of drawing down his Frobisher. He spoke in a low voice, having noted Poirot's close scrutiny of the young man. Hercule Poirot nodded his head. He and Frobisher were sitting close together. The other three had their chairs on the far side of the tea table and were chatting together in an animated but slightly artificial manner. Poirot murmured. Yes. He is magnificent. Magnificent. He is the young bull. Yes, one might say the bull dedicated to Poseidon. A perfect specimen of healthy manhood. Looks fit enough, doesn't he? Frobisher sighed. His shrewd little eyes stole sideways, considering Hercule Poirot. Presently he said. I know who you are, you know all that. It is no secret P. Poirot waved a royal hand. He was not incognito, the gesture seemed to say. He was traveling as himself. Frobisher. He spoke in a low voice, having noted Poirot's close scrutiny of the young man. Hercule Poirot nodded his head. He and Frobisher were sitting close together. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.